uh, very informative uh, thing about the Knights of Columbus, especially the our founder, uh, Father Michael McKinney. At this point, I'd like to call the uh, second speaker for the night. Our second speaker for the night is born and raised in Saskatoon. He is a priest of the Diocese of Saskatoon, Canada since 1986, that's 32 blessed years. Set to pursue higher studies, he received graduate degrees in philosophy and theology from the Toronto School of Theology, the Gregorian University in Rome and Yale, Yale University, and then he was known to the Archdiocese of Edmonton. After working with the undergraduates and teachers at St. Joseph College at the University of Alberta, he moved to administrative development and professional work as Dean of Theology and Vice President at Newman Theological College, as well as heading Newman's Benedict the 16th Institute for the New Evangelization. His work in stewardship and development led him to found Vocatus, a movement for spiritual formation for business leaders. His work on critical issues arising from engaging contemporary culture has led him to travel extensively across North America as lecturer, workshop as facilitator, consultant, retreat master, mission preacher, and animator of Catholic communities. Called back by Bishop Mark, Father Pena is thrilled to be the rector of St. Paul's Co-Cathedral and formator of teachers and administrators of Greater Saskatoon Catholic Schools. His particular loves are his nephews and nieces, there are ten, and grand nephews three, gardening, and of course pasta. His greatest joy, serving the Eucharist Lord as priest. And of course, follow him on Twitter at uh, FRS Pen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let's all welcome very reverend Father, Father Stephen of Pena. Well, yes, you should stand now because you might be difficult to stand when you're sleeping uh, in the midst of my talk. <laughs> While we're standing, let's turn to the Lord and let us ask him through the intercession of St. Michael to defend this evening from anything that could distract us, that any pestilence that could be around that seeks to infect us. And especially let us ask that St. Michael defend our brothers and sisters, wherever in the world they are facing deep challenges in their faith, especially in their family lives. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl throughout the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus. Most sacred heart of Jesus. Have mercy on us. Most sacred heart of Jesus. Have mercy on us. St. Francis Xavier. Pray for us. Our Lady of Victories. Pray for us. St. Joseph. Pray for us. Can't quite invoke Michael McGimby yet, but soon and very soon. Let us be seated. Now, how's the sound working? Are we okay? People are not like screaming. Greetings to everyone. You said in Canada, in the United States, and in the Philippines. 
Wonderful. I ate a whole bunch of pan sit before I came here tonight, which I need that because otherwise my cummerbund will fall down on my cassock. It's a very strange thing to actually see. Uh, you know you're getting old as a priest when the state deputy is younger than you are, but thank you very much, Joe, for that wonderful reflection on the life of one of my heroes, especially as a parish priest. This is the first time in 34 years of priesthood, I was 32 years of priest, before I became a pastor. I was always a teacher and an academic, and now I'm a pastor. And in preparing to become a pastor, I read the beautiful biography of Father Michael McGivney, and inspired by his passionate, extraordinary order, ordinariness. Extraordinary ordinariness. He's a great image for us parish priests, huh? Because he's not a highfalutin bishop or an academic. He was a grunt in the trenches, faced with a deep reality of being with and for his people at a critical time of difficulty, and he threw his all into it. And at 38, when he died in the midst of a pandemic, because that's what was going through the United States Eastern Seaboard at the time, he was burnt out and left nothing on the table. Brothers and sisters, that's the first call that we have tonight to hear. Our Lord Jesus has not created us to be wimps, but to be witnesses. And that means that when we stand in his presence, we are able to say, Lord, I did my best. Pope Francis always says that's the thing, that we would want to be able to say, Lord, I did my best. Let us ask that Lord to help me to do my best this evening. Praise be Jesus Christ. Bow and pray. This is a marvelous time to be, especially with here uh, with a group of Filipino Knights of Columbus in this parish of St. Francis Xavier, a parish of long loved. It's been sort of an anchor in the sister parish of St. Joseph's, where I grew up. St. Francis Xavier was the great patron of the East the missionary of the gospel of the Lord in the subcontinent and all points east so that the Philippines, in a sense, is the grandchild place of his faith. So here, the grandchildren of that great saint, Francis Xavier, asked me to come. Thank you, Arnel. Thank you very much for, and you, Danny, for that wonderful introduction. To ask me to come, and be with you tonight. Now, it's really important to recognize that in the Filipino community, we have a gift that God has given to our church in Canada. It's dynamism, it's presence, it's enthusiasm, it's deep-rootedness in faith has been to the church in Canada and to the Knights of Columbus essentially a life. Our churches would be pretty empty. When I was in Edmonton, the parish I was in, people would ask me, what's your largest mass? And I would say, the 1120, because everybody operated on Filipino time. That means mass started at 11, and you could have fired a cannonball through it, and you wouldn't have hit anybody. But 1120, they were hanging from the rafters. But this is the way in which the church is now full with a kind of bubbling excitement. And the sadness now as a pastor is not to have a church full like that. Eh? As the opposite inclination of the Filipino community, which is to get together and celebrate, is enforced upon us. As we have to be separated. Mm. You share, however, Filipinos, with Father McGivney, the experience of being a first generation immigrant to North America, because that's what he was. He came in a time of deep sorrow and brokenness in the country of Ireland into a place that was not very welcoming. And he was an immigrant. He was an American, but he was
was an immigrant. And it's important to remember that. I am so blessed to be a Knight of Columbus. In fact, this is my 40th year of being a Knight. I became one as a young seminary. And the Knights of Columbus became even more intimately part of my life. This for five years, while studying at Yale University in New Haven, I worshipped, celebrated Mass, and was really involved in the parish church of St. Mary's, where the Knights of Columbus were founded. And there he was, always in the back corner, in a beautiful marble covering, granite actually. There he was in the back, day in and day out, always being with me in my praying as I worship. I was there when the Knights of Columbus had started to do projects to renovate the bathrooms in the basement, and they put a hole in the wall. And while I was hearing confessions during the beginning of a retreat, someone came from the street and stuffed a whole bunch of watchtower magazines into that hole in the wall and set it on fire. And I was sitting, and so the fire started literally right underneath me. Smoke started coming up, and people were, what to do? And the priest at the front, I said, get out of the church! And they all, we all ran, and I spent the time running around, saving the vestments, the Eucharist, doing what we put in. It wasn't a real miracle that that building did not completely burn, because the fire crews were able to stop it just before it got into the roof. I was sick for days, having breathed in, that terrible smoke, but it was a different kind of fire that Father McGimby lived there. And he was there protecting his church during that. He was there when I celebrated Mass at the big new Mass on September the 12th, 2001. I had just returned from being in New York, and the church was full with people devastated by the terrorist attack. And we were confronted, excuse me, it was December the 13th, it was the Thursday. We were confronted by the word of God, the gospel that said, turn the other cheek. Right after that 9-11 disaster, that took the life of three of the parishioners in one of the parishes I was helping them was to just transfix us in Connecticut in all of the United States. There was Father McGibney helping me to understand, helping us to understand what turning the other cheek is. Doesn't mean being a doormat. No Irishman would ever be a doormat. It means turning the cheek in such a way that you can't be dismissed and backhanded. But you stand up and say, I will not participate in your violent act Neither will I allow you to backhand and dismiss me, for I am a child of God, redeemed in Jesus, and I stand and demand that you see me as a person. That is the way in which Michael McGivney responded to the persecution, and it was, the persecution and dismissal and bigotry that he, along with his Catholic, Irish, German, soon-to-be German immigrants faced in the middle of the 19th century. Saint soon, Michael McGivney has been there through, with our community of brotherhood, through wars, through depressions and disasters through political struggles, through these very intense modern moments in our church's life. I was blessed also to be so near to Grand Central Station of the Knights of Columbus. I got to know Virgil Deckett, may he rest in peace, what a great man he was in his beautiful life. And then Carl Anderson and his family, a man of depth and holiness, Remarkable that someone who these two 
two men who should have operated, you think, with the dismissive arrogance of a CEO of a huge bulk billion dollar company manifested none of this because the spirit of Michael McGivney wouldn't let it keeps their feet on the ground. These are indeed remarkable times. Pope Francis has spoken of them as a this coronavirus is a worldwide tragedy in the midst of an unfolding third world war. He says there's a war that's been going on, violent sparks all over the place, deep upheavals in the culture. And in the midst of this tragedy, what do we do in the face of war? In which we're being backhanded over and over again by our society, no, by our circumstances, so that we don't know where to turn. The thing about war is that there is absolutely nothing great or glorious about it. In itself, war is only violence, destruction, rape, and death. There's nothing good in war, except that within that horror can be found goodness. Where? In the indomitable will of people who refuse to surrender to the logic of anger and of destruction and violence and isolation and fear, but who rather rather stand up and live in a different way. The way that was expressed in the first reading from the funeral I celebrated this morning of a brother gone to the Lord. St. Paul, the heavenly patron of the cathedral and the diocese, wrote this. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away our inner nature, inner nature is being renewed every day. For this, it seems to be a moment that never ends. This is a slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Therefore, because we look not at what can be seen, but at what is unseen. For what we can see is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. Second Corinthians. This is how the men who were gathered in fellowship with Father McGivney and their family lived and today live. We live looking at what cannot be seen. And then we see and live in the world in a completely different way. Looking and seeing the unseen. I mean, in the First World War, that conflagration that destroyed Europe and destroyed with Europe the dream of Christendom, of there ever being nations united under Christ, that died in the trenches of the First World War, which did not end in 1918. Indeed, one could argue that they didn't, that war did not end until it had passed through the butchery of the Second World War. And then in the consequences of that, the massacres and suffering in the communist world that only came down in Europe with the fall of the Berlin Wall. It was a century of war. But in that First World War, the Knights of Columbus leapt forward, seeing something that was not allowed to be seen by the great movers. 
You might have heard the story about the first Christmas during the Great War, the First World War, when the soldiers got up from the German trenches and from the Allied trenches and started having a football game. Right? They said, we're not going to kill each other tonight. It's the night of Christ Jesus. Let's be humans. The generals the next day found out what was going on, and that never happened again. What did the Knights of Columbus do in the midst of that? They established, when the Americans came into the war in the last year, they established centers where men could come together and play and pray and be human. They established places where in the midst of an inhuman war, where people could not be seen, they established places where men could reconnect their humanity in the midst of inhumanity, making visible the unseen. The knights had a Catholic vision that brothers were what men were created to be. They didn't just talk about it. They made it real. In the war that's waged today with sophisticated tools of twisted education and of corrupted and corrupting policies, we have a new kind of war in which the powers of this world do not want us to see the humanity of the other. It's the war against the inconvenient. Those who are inconvenient in their presence and their living in our presence, who think differently than we, who look differently than we are more than that. It's a war.